All right. Thank you, folks. Good to have everybody here this morning. We're still here. Amen. We're going to continue with our study of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. This morning, look at it from a little different perspective now. As it uh, as we as we uh, attempt to uh, study this very important doctrine of the Bible, Father, in Thy name, I pray for the wisdom that You promise for those that lack it. Ask of God, and You said that You would give it liberally. I need that this morning, my heavenly Father. I don't want to butcher this book. I don't want to lay it before me, our Heavenly Father, as something written by a man that can be dissected so quickly and so easily with a human mind. But God, give me wisdom and discernment. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, this morning I'm going to talk about Satan's gradual downfall. And I want to show you how that relates to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. As I've said before, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two uh, entirely separate at different kingdoms, although at times they do run concurrent. They're running together. Uh, there are good people who believe that they are the same, that there is no difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and that the term is simply used interchangeably in the New Testament and throughout Scripture. Uh, I do not believe that, <clears throat> though I respect the people who do. That's uh, you know We can respect each other. And hopefully, uh, if uh, here's the bottom line, if everybody has the same opinion, there's only one of them thinking. And God wants you to, uh, He wants you to think, He wants you to pray. Uh, you'll find out that in uh, in Christian circles, that there's so an awful lot of stuff that is. Uh, uh, that is accepted as fact, which in reality there's an awful lot of uh, uh, doubt about some of the things that are that are preached as pure fact. And so, if you come up against something and you have this nagging doubt in your heart and in your soul and in your mind about it, don't necessarily blame it on the devil. It could be the Holy Spirit trying to lead you into some light. So uh, this morning we want to look at Lucifer, <clears throat> the light bearer. And how he relates to the kingdom of God. Now, the first thing we need to know about this creature is what kind of creature he is. What is he? Look at Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 18. This is the beginning that we can, a starting point that we can uh, launch out from as it relates to uh, Lucifer. Luke chapter number 10, verse 18. If you notice in verse 17, the Word of God says, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. The word devil is just a generic term. It simply means a, 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 a malevolent creature of some kind. You know, it could, it could be a demon deviling you, see. Or it could be something else. So the devils, and so since the subject was brought up of devils, notice what the Lord does in verse 18. He said unto them, I beheld Satan, S-A-T-A-N, as lightning fall from heaven. There again, that name is very important. Now, names have meaning. The word Satan is an Old Testament Hebrew word carried right straight into into Greek and straight into English. You know, there's not a lot of them like that, but this one is. Because in Hebrew, it is spelt exactly the way you see it here and pronounced almost the way that, that, uh, that an Englishman would pronounce it today. It's Satan. And that is a adversary. That's what the word means. All right. But it is a generic type thing because that word Satan or Satan sometimes in the Old Testament is applied to a man, a man who is an adversary of someone. You see what I mean by that? So what we need to do is find out what his name is. And his name is Lucifer. And we find that in Isaiah chapter number 14. He is the light bearer. That's what the word means, Lucifer. Now here's what the Lord said about him. 
in Luke chapter number 10, verse 18. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now that's a very instructive thing because lightning's moving very fast, 186,000 miles per second is the way it's been uh, measured, the speed of light. So that's fast. In plain words, when he was cast out of his position of authority and great respect in heaven, it was instantaneous. It wasn't, uh, it was no, there was no mitigating circumstances, nothing, bang, you're gone, all right? But that didn't end it. That only began it. And uh, if you look in Luke chapter number 10, verse 18, he said, I saw him as lightning fall from heaven, but that didn't send him to hell. That's not where he went. In, uh, in, the, in the book of Genesis, chapter number 3, Bereshit, the beginning, the book of beginnings, that's what the book of Genesis is. So we can find the beginnings of many things in Genesis. In Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, he's addressing a creature, but there's something much larger here than just that creature. Because thou hast done this, this rever referring back to what? He caused the fall of mankind. All right, because you've done this, he said, because you have done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Notice the curse as it applies to the animal creation. And above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now what's a cow got to do with this, all right? In the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 28, the Bible says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. All right? What's a cherub? Well, the devil is a cherub. Satan is a cherub. Most of the time you hear him referred to as an angel. See, you hear him referred to as an angel because the Bible does say he can transform himself into an angel of light in his ministers and the ministers of righteousness. A cherub. What is a cherub? That's a good question. This is one of those areas that's unclear. A cherubim shows up in the Bible in a number of places. But when they are identified, in other words, a description is, give them, is given of them, they have the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of a man, the face of an eagle. All right, they've got four faces. Notice the ox. Notice the ox. And notice that the curse here in Genesis 3 is above all cattle. See, the bovine, the cow, the cattle. And it's not by coincidence that the Hindu religion has what they call the sacred cow. And the reason for that is because of in reincarnation. They believe that through a successive stages of reincarnation, living out karmas, that eventually you can reach nirvana. That's the Hindu religion. That's, of course, simplified, and uh, there's a lot of variations to it. But that's essentially what they teach. So therefore, they allow this cow to wander around. It's an amazing thing how that in Egypt, it was the sacred cow, Apis the bull, that uh, they, they erected an altar to while Moses was on top of that mountain receiving commandments from God. So, you know, that's a separate study in itself. But the bottom line is that this cherub, this cherub, cherubim, is a mysterious creature. And it is a creature. It doesn't mean that it always appears with the face of a man, a lion, ox, and an eagle. It doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is that if a description in the Bible is given of a cherubim, that's what you get. Now, you notice I use the term cherubim, like Elohim, like seraphim. It's a plural Hebrew noun. Now, this, is, this gets into the part in the Bible to where, you know, like I said to you a moment ago, you don't, know, you don't read the Bible like a book written by a man that you can dissect with your human mind and think you can master it. That's not going to happen. But when God does spend time on something and he does reveal it to us, then it's, it's, there, it's there for a purpose. A cherubim is the face of a man, lion, ox, eagle. That's four creatures, yet combined into one creature. You see what I mean? It's one creature, yet it can be spoken of in a plural way. Just like there's just one God, yet it's a plural Hebrew noun that's used of him, Elohim. 
That's the first time that that word shows up in the Bible. In the beginning, God. Elohim. All right, not three gods, one God, but one God understood in more than just one way. That's the plurality of it. That's, that's the mystery to it. So Satan at the very beginning, when you begin to understand him, you begin to study him, you realize that there's more to him than simply an angel, for example. Because an angel is a different study in itself, and, and, and an angel is, uh, the Greek word is where we get the word angel, angelos, and that means a, a messenger, a sent one, something like that. But that's just what the word means. That doesn't define what an angel is. So Satan is a mysterious creature. Full of mystery, shrouded in mystery, mystery, and he is a cherub, and this cherub found its place in the holy of holies. In other words, nearest to the very throne of God Almighty, even closer than the angels. It was the cherubim inside the holy of the holy of holies. So that's where he came from. He came from a place like that. Now, it's hard for you probably to grasp this this morning, but Satan's not happy about the idea of him falling from that original position. And on top of that, here we have a man that's created from the dust of the ground. Satan came from above. The man came from here. This man is created from the dust of the ground. All Satan saw was the creation of a human body, and then he watched the Almighty breathe into that body, the breath of life, and he watched a being come into being. He became a living soul. Immediately, jealousy and animosity filled him with rage because this man was given the keys to the kingdom of God and the keys to the kingdom of heaven. For what God said in the book of Genesis, he said, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air. Not only that, he's compared to the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense that Adam and the last Adam are compared together. They are the federal head of a whole new race, a whole new beginning of mankind. The first Adam, last Adam. Therefore, everything that happens with mankind is either in the first Adam or the last Adam. That's a big deal. And Satan's no fool when it comes to something like that, and he observed it. So immediately he set about to destroy that relationship, that power, that authority, to take that kingdom of God and that kingdom of heaven away from him. And, uh, and when he did... This is when God cursed him again, the second time, and because thou hast done this thing. Now, of course, that leads into a lot of thoughts. I mean, if you get into stuff and begin to and begin to and, and, and read into it and, and, and think on it, why, well, you'll have to say to yourself, you've got to say to yourself, you're forced to say, what do you mean this thing? Does that mean that because of the severity of what he did, because of the fact that it was related to the man, that that brought a specific judgment on him? In plainer words, does that mean, therefore, that God's relationship with him was conditional? You see what I mean? Because thou hast done this thing. You see what I mean? This is why the Bible is... Uh, this is why, also... That any occult world that you get into and begin to read, any of them, you'll always find them elevate Lucifer above the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll always teach that Lucifer was done wrong, that he didn't get a fair shake, and that Lucifer is the source of light, exactly as Albert Pike said it in his Morals and Dogma. He said, strange name for a creature of darkness, Lucifer. He said, is he, is he not the true light bearer? To paraphrase him, I can't quote him exactly, but that's what Albert Pike was saying. In plain words, he said, if you want the truth, if you want the light, if you want to know what's going on, you don't go to Jesus Christ in the Bible, you go to Lucifer. That's what he said. You get a hold of that. <laughs> because that is what you call the parting of the ways and the crux of the matter. And when you stand and you try to argue with a Satanist or with a witch, with a, with a, with a witch or with, a, with an occultist or whatever, the source of your authority is the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ. The source of their authority is Lucifer and the occult hidden world. That's what the word occult means, by the way, hidden. So, second downfall, second, second, uh, second judgment was when he was cast out, cursed, above all cattle. And, uh, and then, of course, the man, the man was cursed. Now, this immediately brings up the question. 
uh, does God know everything? Do you think the earth, do you think the world, do you think God's relationship with mankind is as simple as you hear it preached most of the time? I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> I hope after you've lived a few years in this world that you realize that you are not going to convert this world. That nowhere in the Word of God does it say that the church of the living God will convert the world. The only time the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the seas is in the tribulation leading in the millennium. It is through the Jew and not the church. That's when the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So if you really want to convert the world, get the church out of it. If you really want to send the gospel to the ends of the earth, get the church raptured out of this world. And once the Jew becomes the head of all the nations, the knowledge of the Lord will spread to the ends of the earth through the Jew. Yes, sir. I'm not adding anything to the Word of God. That's exactly the perspective of Scripture. But in any event, I have to ask myself this question. Why is this? What's going on? What is really going on? What's happening today? Why is there an Antichrist? What's God's purpose in the Antichrist? What's God's purpose in this? When I look at Satan, I say to myself, You know, Satan, you have had a choice, free will, to make every choice you've made. But your maker, your creator, is infinitely greater and above you. As the stars are above this accursed planet, as the star is above the dust of the field, so is Almighty God above His creation, even the highest of His creatures. He is still infinitely above them. Amen. So does that bully, do you believe that God could use Satan? Well, of course He could. Yes, sir. You're talking about Satan? Pardon? Right. Okay. Okay. That's true, because the Bible says they live in a they live in a fantasy world. Yeah. Filthy dreamers, the Bible calls them. Yeah. The unsaved man for the most part lives in a in a in a make believe world. He really does. He really does. And he spends all of his time trying to escape from the world he's in. Through bottle, through drugs, through everything else. So, since you know, and you do know, certainly you know, that the Almighty knows exactly what he's doing, then he has a purpose for Satan. Right? Yeah. Because if God ever had to react to anything, he is no longer the Almighty omniscient creator God that I know. He reacts to nothing. Known unto God are all of his works. He knows them all. Of course, I've said that this is a point of pitting holiness against wickedness. There's a point to be made and something to be proven. And he proves it to his creatures. That's me. I'm a creature. And the creator will do that. Now, Satan's not through, though. He's not finished. In, uh, at the cross, if you'll turn to Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 15. Colossians chapter number 2 and verse 15. <coughs> Ephesians and Colossians, just think of them, are two books written in the heavens. <laughs> Well, that high and holy doctrine. In Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 15, Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, what's, how did, do you think that Pontius Pilate saw that? <clears throat> you don't suppose that to Annas and Caiaphas or, or any of the rest of them around had a clue what was going on here, do you? Of course not. What about the apostles? Well, they were hiding. So who's, lo who's looking? See? Who's looking? He made a show. All right, look at verse number 14. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. The apostle Paul, when he, when he deals with... with, with uh, 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 what's the word? 
degrading legalism. Legalism all, cannot exist only at the expense of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that legalism can exist is at the expense of what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross. Now just put that down in your soul. It cannot exist otherwise. It must, it must destroy what Christ did in order, in order for legalism to live. And whether it's Christian legalism or whether it's uh, Jewish legalism or whatever it is, it must. It cannot embrace grace. It cannot understand forgiveness. It knows nothing about the power of God to really convert the soul. That's why all of this stuff is brought down on top of a man and, he has to, and, he, and he's got this created world to live in that some man dictates to him and tells him when to get up and when to go to bed and where he can go and what he can say and what he can do. Everything is external to him. It all has to be written down somewhere. And he has to be able to see it. He has to be able to, he has to, be able to process it like that because they can never trust what's inside. See, You never set a man free by what you put around him. You make him free by what you do inside him. It has to be done inside. Freedom starts inside. You can, you, you, you can take a man and lock him up in a prison bar, behind prison bars, but that man is free inside. He's free. You might be able to take his mobility away from him, but you can't take his soul away from him. And that's his identity. Not his mobility, his soul. So the apostle says that he made a show of them openly. All right. Well, the people weren't watching this. The Apostle Paul interpreted it, and the only reason he said this is because it was given to him by inspiration. So who saw it? Well, the spirit world saw it, for one thing. And God the Father saw it. So what was happening here with the Lord Jesus Christ is a spiritual battle beyond understanding that took place that day. Satan tried his best to kill him before he ever got to the cross. At his... At, when he was, when he was uh, uh, at his birth, less than two years of age, Herod had all these children, male children, put to death. When he was a young man in Nazareth, they tried to run him over a, over a, a cliff and they tried to kill him. Uh, when, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he, when, during his lifetime... The Jewish authorities followed him, and they, were, and they were constantly scheming about some way to get rid of this man. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to do away with him. Uh, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, it enraged them to the point that they had a council, and they got together. What can we do to get rid of him? They wanted to kill him. <laughs> they wanted to kill him, but they couldn't kill him. No man could kill him. You know why they couldn't kill him? Because he was walking in the power of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> they couldn't kill him. And so uh, Satan finally got him to the cross, but he probably realized that the cross was for a reason. That there was something going on at that cross more than just the death of a man. It was the death of the God-man. And they couldn't kill the God-man. He had to offer himself. So by giving his life, he offered himself without spot to God. That's a true sacrifice. A true sacrifice is for you to give your life, not be taken from you. And he gave himself. So, uh, there he made a show of him openly. So what did he do? He made a point. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, Satan, no doubt, the Bible said that the bulls of Bashan in the book of Psalm 22 had gathered about him. And the bulls of Bashan is a... Is a, is a, is a is an Old Testament way of saying that he was encompassed with demons. They were everywhere. They were all over the place. They were everywhere. And in my lifetime, I've only seen one thing that ever reminded me of something like that. And I, and I saw, I witnessed it just a few years ago. And I was greatly impressed. I witnessed something that's real now. This is not reality. This is real, real. So what is it? When Saddam Hussein was standing on that ledge over there, and they had a rope tied around his neck. You may not understand what was going on, but he was being taunted. He was being cursed by every Arab in that room. They were cursing him. They were taunting him. They, were, they had gathered around him, and they were saying, You're about to die. We're going to hang you. And he stood there like a man, boy. Now, I'm not, taking, I'm not saying Saddam Hussein some great thing. But you've got to give him his due. 
He stood there right in front of every one of them, and all of those people gathered around him, mocking him and making fun of him. He held his head up high, and he looked straight forward and probably said, Get this over with. And they dropped the trap door, and he hung him. That's what happened to the Lord Jesus. When he was hanging on that cross, the people were making fun of him. Oh, yeah. But the spirit world were accusing him. The demons were gathered around him, and they were firing darts at him. In other words, he was in the midst of complete hostility, not a friend to be found. He was dying alone on that tree. And there he was giving himself as a sacrifice for you and me. Yeah, he did. That's the kind of sacrifice that Christ, Christ gave, that he died. You can't take anything from that. That's courage. That's courage. That's courage. And when you see courage anywhere, you have to respect it. You've got to respect courage. And, uh, and, and when the Lord died, he died brave. Courage. He trusted himself to the Father's hand. They mocked him said, you trusted in God that he would deliver you? Let him deliver you now. Remember they threw that in his face? Where is your God? You say you're a prophet and you say you're the Mashiach? Well, where is he now? Where is your God? They threw every vile accusation they could against him. He took it all. And didn't make a didn't 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 lash out at him. He died before them. He died in courage, and he gave himself for us. He made a show of them openly. Amen. And Satan fell a little bit more. In Revelation chapter number twenty, and verse number three. No, I jumped one. Ezekiel 28, 18. This is very important. This helps put everything in perspective. Ezekiel 28, 18. Satan is the great imitator. You've heard it said before that imitation is the greatest form of flattery. They can curse you to your face and say they don't appreciate what you're doing and then go out and do the same thing. <laughs> well, what he has done is just, he, what he has done is just praise what you're doing. Because if you imitate what someone's doing, how, how much greater praise could you give them? You couldn't give them anything greater. In Ezekiel 28, verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring thee forth, will I bring, <clears throat> therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes. Now watch carefully what you're reading upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee and all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be any more now look at the context carefully what's going on here who is this in Revelation chapter number 13 when the beast that rises up out of the sea receives a deadly wound to its head uh, I believe it dies or at least why it goes into some sort of a death uh, death itself is, is measured in gradations too <laughs> death is not a simple thing but in any event in Revelation 13 when this beast dies after three days Life comes back into this thing. And it rises from the dead. <clears throat> the scripture calls it two names. The man of sin, and then the what? The son of perdition. For the first three and one half years of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will be any man like any man. Any man qualifies. Any man qualifies, except a born-again believer. With the Holy Ghost in him. Other than that, any man qualifies. Any man qualifies to be the Antichrist. And then, for the next three and one half years, he is literally Satan incarnate. 
If you look at the 12th chapter of Revelation, you'll see that the devil is cast down to the earth. Notice the gradations of his fall. He's cast down to the earth. Well, before that, he had access to a place where he accused the brethren before God. If you read that in the book of Job, he said, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. Sons of God presented themselves before the Lord. There was somewhere that they came into a place where God manifested himself somehow to these creatures, and they communicated with him. And Satan was there with them. Satan can no more enter into the Holy of Holies than he can, than, than he can save himself. You see what I mean? God, in his essence, as God the Father, dwells in the Holy of Holies. But anyway, these, they come before him. But they're ca he's cast down. His angels are cast down. Revelation 12. Cast down to the earth. So when Satan is cast down to the earth, he incarnates himself. He literally goes into the body of a man. You say, how can he do that? He's a spirit being. You remember what those devils did when they were cast out of the, uh, out of that, uh, the man who had all these devils in him? They went into, in, into what? You had one man, but there was a herd of swine, see? See? That one man had all those devils in him. And that also shows you something else, too. It shows you the, the infinite difference between a human being and an animal. You see, the human being, being being made in the image of God is capable of having so much more in him in one man. You see, but when, 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 the, when all those legions of devils left that one man, they filled up a whole herd of swine. See the difference? Yeah, that's the difference. The capacity of a man is infinitely greater than that of an animal. But anyway, they went, into the, they went into the herd of swine, and, and you know what happened? They ran over the, over the slope and were drowned in, in the sea below. The, uh, the spirit beings, though, these spirits inhabited, they, in, they went into the body of these swine, and they ran over the, over, the, over the moat. Now, here's the thing, and here's the point that you've got to watch out for in the Bible. You've got to watch this, because this is one of those things that, that, it, that it's, not, it's not easy to figure the... Uh, let me, just, let me just give it to you, and then you think on it. I want you to think. The Bible said the angels that kept not their first estate, all right, their first estate, all right, they came in unto the daughters of men, all right? That meant they left something and went somewhere. And when they came to the daughters of men, the Bible said they, they knew these women, these daughters of men in Genesis 6, and angel and not angels, but giants were born unto them. Now, I believe that literally happened. I believe angels go have it with women, and giants were born. But here's the thing. The indication is that once they left their habitation, they could never return to it. See, that's the point. They could not return. There's some kind of a line there that God has drawn to where you cross the line, you can't go back over it. It's just like when God incarnated himself in flesh. He never went back over that line. That God-man will be forever. And this is something you hear nothing about in most Christian churches because they have no concept of it. And I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. It took me years to get a hold of what I just said to you. When we talk about God giving His only begotten Son, we're talking about it in a much greater sense than we even understand it. When He crossed that line, He could never cross back over. Once He incarnated Himself as a man, that incarnation was forever. And ought to be. For the God-man is forever the Savior. There is no other Savior. Apart from Him. Yes, sir. <coughs> they did. Yeah, He gave them permission to. They don't, well, they said, don't let us go off into the abyss. They didn't want to go off into the abyss. Yeah. They're intelligent beings, you know. They, they don't want to be. It's what you call it is a disembodied spirit. They didn't want to be that. And this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 5. He said, we would be clothed upon. When a, when a saint of God leaves this body, all right, you are a spirit being. It's awful, it's awful convenient to have a body. I said that in a way to make you think. You're not your body, but it's nice to have one. So when you leave this body behind, where are you going? Well, the Bible says you've got a home in heaven, eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. But you've got to look at it very carefully now. Look at it carefully. 
That's not your glorified body, because the glorified body does not come up from the ground until the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the dead in Christ, he brings with him. They that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Corinthians 15, that which is sown is mortal, but it will be raised immortal. That is sown terrestrial, but it will be raised celestial. That is sown dishonorably, but it will be raised with honor. It will be sown with no glory. It will be raised glorious. That's what you're going to be clothed with permanently. That glorified body that comes up, see? Why? Because you're a spirit being. It's nice to have a body. But you can exist without the body. Say, so how do you know that? All right, let me ask you a question. How long has God the Father existed? How long did He exist without a body? Well, sure. I mean, you know, that's, um, that's one of those questions that, had, that answers itself. When did he get a body? Well, 2,000 years ago. The Son of God is God Almighty in flesh. First Timothy 3.16, without controversy, God, great is the mystery of God in us. God, he who was manifest in the flesh. Am I wrong? That's what the new Bibles say. God was manifest in the flesh. All right, so this issue of the Spirit need, uh, doesn't have to have a body, but it's convenient to have one. I mean, after all, folks, I, <laughs> you wouldn't want to spend eternity as a spirit being with, you know, I mean, invisible, no body. That's why He's prepared a body for you. Your body helps give you identity, but it's not you. It just helps give identity. But with a glorified body... A conjunction takes place. A joining together takes place. It will never be separated again. Body, soul, and spirit are united in the heavens with Christ. And that's what you will be forever. Because it is a spiritual body. Subject and capable of merging with a spirit being. See? All right. Now when Satan, in Revelation 13, incarnates himself, and I think that's what he's going to do. And there's probably some reasons for this, but I think he's going to incarnate himself into a man. And when he does this, that man is going to be the son of perdition. He's going to be Satan incarnate in flesh. Now, that's some heavy-duty stuff, isn't it? It really is. The reason I said that is because it, uh, this, 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 this drawing, this line right here, is not, is not easy to figure because, you see... If you look carefully at it, it says in Revelation chapter number 13 that the deadly wound was healed. What I just read to you from Ezekiel is talking about who? What's he talk, who's, who's, who's the subject of Ezekiel? When he says, I'll bring a fire forth from the midst of thee. It is Lucifer, but who are they looking at? They're looking at a man, folks. They're looking at the Antichrist as he's literally thrown down before them. The types in the Old Testament time and again where the king was thrown down before the victor. The Antichrist will be thrown down in bodily form before them and a fire literally comes out from the inside of him. And that fire literally envelops him. And that Antichrist is taken at that moment and he's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. But does that end, does that end Satan? No. Because you see, at the end of tribulation period, Satan goes into the, into the bottomless pit. He's bound by a chain. The Bible says in Revelation 9, the Scripture says, a strong angel comes down from heaven and he binds that old serpent for a thousand years. All right? So what's happening here? What's going on? Satan's lost his body, hadn't he? But he didn't lose his being. Okay, The man lived as a man for the first three and one half years, but then once Satan incarnated himself into his body, the man was no more. Now it is, now it is literally Satan incarnate in flesh. He loses his body. His body dies. His body burned up. And that spirit that is the Antichrist goes into the, into the, into the, into the bottomless pit. Now, uh, he goes into the lake of fire. All right. Notice the continual downfall of Satan. Notice, he starts in heaven, he's cast out of that position in heaven, but he's not cast down to hell. He's cast down to the earth. Once he's cast down to the earth, he tempts our parents, 
and he's, well, from that moment, he's cast away from that position of authority that, he, that, that, uh, that allowed him to do that. And he is cast down to the earth in the sense that now he is cursed on the earth. Thou art cursed above all cattle. A curse is placed upon him. See the progression? If I've learned anything about God, I've learned that he progressively does things. There is a progression with him. And the reason I say that is because... Uh, if the thing I've learned about the Lord is that He's a merciful, gracious, long-suffering God. And if you don't appreciate that, you don't appreciate the way He's been with you because He's been merciful and gracious and long-suffering <laughs> with every last one of us. Somebody said one time, well, I don't believe man, man ought to have a second chance. Everybody in this house has had 30. <laughs> 40, 50, 100, 1,000. Right? How many feel like you've had at least 20 chances? <laughs> people can create this little theological world that sounds good but it's not really it's not really true there's no reality to it uh, I don't like the idea of electric fire I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't rejoice in that the fact of the matter is I just as soon leave here and go off with the almighty let him take care of what's happening with the, with the judgment I mean, would you want to be there that day when they're turned into the lake of fire? And, and, and No, I don't be there. I don't, I don't care anything about that. I don't have any morbid fascination to, to see something like that, you know. Don't, don't care about it. Yeah. Right. Uh, the Bible said in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 29... Hebrews 12, 29. If you'd like to turn there, just turn there and read it. Hebrews is one of my favorite books, folks. It's a powerful, powerful book. Hebrews 12, verse 29. Somebody read it for us. That's what it says. It? That's what it says, isn't it? All right. There's a number of types in the Old Testament that relate to that. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, when they were cast into that burning, fiery furnace, you remember? <coughs> there was a fourth in there with them. Well, the fire, the only thing it could do, didn't even singe their hair. What did it do? It just burned away the, the, uh, their bonds. All right? The fire. All right? Now, the fire of Manoah, when he saw it rise up like that, it took up the sacrifice. If you remember when Elijah went to the top of Carmel, what did that fire do? The fire went all the way around that altar and it just licked up. It licked up. That fire would no more have burned Elijah than that fire would have burned Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. No, would not have would not have singed a hair on his head. The Bible said there's a new heavens and a new earth, for the former things are passed away. The Bible said the elements will melt as fervent heat. You'll probably be there in the sense that God wants you to see it. That as you walk into or you progress through this, this immense oven, this, this, this boiling inferno, it's all around you. And it, you're, I mean, you're right in the middle of it. And it is consuming everything. Yet it doesn't touch you. It's just like standing under a spring water. You go right through it. Yes, sir. Well, they couldn't handle it. Seven times hotter, the fire reached out and grabbed them, didn't it? No, sir, brother. Yeah, the Bible says in Revel in the book of in the book of Acts, it said he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. What that means is that I don't mock hell. I don't make fun about hell. There's nothing to make fun about. But if you're truly born again, you have no fear of hell. Because even if you were walking in the midst of hell, it could not touch you. You belong to Him. You are a son of God by the new birth. You see, you're not protected from hell because of where you are. You're protected from hell because of who you are. There's a big difference in what I'm talking about. What He changed you into is a creature. You'll never be God. You can't become God. If that's true, then God could become God. But you are a creature that has been elevated to the highest position, even above cherubim, seraphim, angels, and the rest of them. 
that one day God will be able to do for you what he could never do for any other creature. You will literally be indestructible with immortality and with the very image of the Almighty blazoned in your soul. And you'll live and never die. And we'll stop at that and pick it up again next week. The gradual fall of Satan. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word. Let the sweet Holy Ghost come into this.